and from the National Physical Laboratory based in Taipei, the UK. Uh, this paper is a joint work between NPL and Futronic, and the presentation of uh, uh, valuable contributions uh, from three colleagues from Futronic, uh, Ding Jian, uh, Chris Park, uh, who is retired now, and Mike Tim is also in the audience. <coughs> So first slide is a very quick and brief introduction about myself. Uh, I spent, before joining MPL, I spent 10 years at Birmingham University uh, doing filter design. So I actually come from background of micro circuit design. <coughs> and this is my second arms conference. Uh, I have presented a paper about uh, 3D printing uh, circuits for RF micro applications two years ago at the same venue, same hotel, yeah, different people. <coughs> and, uh, uh, I joined MPL in uh, October 2017, and since then I have been working on measurements, <coughs> particularly uh, on wafer measurement <coughs> at the mean drawer frequencies and uh, characterizations of dielectric materials at mean drawer frequencies using open resonators of free space technique. <coughs> Initially, I thought the measurement was simple, but then I found, them, I myself, I found myself wrong. Measurement could be very complex, uh, but important and sometimes exciting. So <coughs> next, I want to share with you uh, some of my work I have done uh, with Fieldtronic on, on wafer measurement at the mean through frequencies. Here is an outline of my talk. Uh, we'll start with an uh, introduction. <coughs> then I will review some uh, commercial on wafer calibration tactics. <coughs> the third part of my talk, uh, I will go through some uh, recent activities in mean through on wafer calibrations undertaken at MPL and Fieldtronic. <coughs> I will start with the uh, introduction of uh, measurement capability at NPL, and then I will list uh, the factors affecting uh, this uh, on wafer measurement uh, when, you, when the frequency rises to mean frequencies. frequencies. <coughs> and, uh, then, and then I will uh, give three examples, uh, which the first one is, uh, uh, is about the design of TRL calibration standards, and the second one is the impact of labor structures during measurement. And the third example is the comparison of S parameters between waveguide and on wafer. Uh, I'm sure you're all uh, very familiar with this. Uh, this is a typical on wafer S parameter measurement system. You have a railway and uh, cables and the uh, frequency extender pads uh, to move up frequency to mean to it and even to parameters. And then you have uh, probes and then you have a probe station here. <coughs> so <coughs> there are three types of measurement errors. <coughs> uh, you measure device and you get the data, and there are three types of errors uh, associated with them. Uh, the systematic error, that's, uh, for example, imperfection in VNAs, and uh, test setup, I mean, due to probes and cables, and also measuring the reference planes, maybe they are not uh, at the, right, uh, the pr uh, pr place where you want them to be. There are also random errors uh, associated with the measurement data. Uh, they are varying in a random fashion. Uh, contributors uh, include uh, instrument noise, and switch, and connector repeatability. There are also drift errors. Uh, they are for example, system performance will change after calibration has been done. Uh, usually, uh, temperature variation is the main cause. Uh, this uh, drift errors can be corrected by a recalibration. So calibration can remove the systematic and the drift errors from the measurement results. Uh, I, uh, here, this slide shows the typical RF probes uh, with CPW uh, probe tip configurations. Uh, this is actually from a paper published by a previous speaker uh, uh, as you can see, uh, although they all of these have the GSG uh, uh, probe tip configurations, they, they, they may have uh, different styles, come from different styles. And here, choose uh, what's inside of these probes. You have a coaxial input, and then you have a CPW output here. This uh, photograph shows the D-band, I mean, from 110 to 170 gears, uh, GSG probe tips as MPL. The pitch size is 100 micron. The pitch size is uh, just a distance between the single and ground pitch, the center to center distance. <coughs> so calibration standards, uh, on wafer uh, calibration standards can be used as a reference device in on wafer calibrations. Basic standards include uh, open, short, low, and through. And their electrical behavior are very different from each other, and this is preferable to calibrations. So if you use standards which have very similar electric behavior, then uh, it's not ideal in terms of, of calibration. <coughs> However, the standards are not ideal uh, due to the existence of uh, parasitic capacitance and inductance, uh, particularly at very high frequencies. 
Uh, for example, for open uh, when you uh, lambda probe, you have this parasitic capacitance, and for and here is the expression of the capacitance. For short, you have parasitic inductance and the load. Uh, you, you hope it is a 50 ohm a real number impedance, but, but in reality it's a complex number, and for screw it's the same. So <coughs> uh, these uh, parasitic capacitance and inductance need to be taken into account if you want to perform our wave calibration to probe tips. Uh, probe manufacturer usually specify calibration coefficients, the CO, C1, C2, and LL. Uh, for specific uh, probe spacing, and uh, used with a particular impedance standard substrate. So uh, please bear this in mind. So, so that means uh, if uh, for some calibration technique, if they are relying on the logic of this calibration coefficient, they will be very sensitive to probe placement errors because these coefficients were supplied by the manufacturer and they were for specific probe spacing with used with the particular impedance standard substrate. So now uh, I'm going to uh, review very quickly about a few uh, very commercial calibration techniques uh, for our wafer measurement. The first one is SOLT, short, uh, open, load, and through. <laughs> SOLT requires a rigorous definition of calibration standards. So basically, you need to load the electric behavior of all these standards very well. So if you load that, uh, SOLT is very robust and very good. Uh, however, uh, sometimes you don't load that. So I'll talk about this more about this later. So, and the uh, elastic load that is calibration coefficients are defined for a particular probe placement. So, so that means a uh, result SOLT calibration is relatively sensitive, sensitive to probe placement errors. So, if you when you do a calibration, if your probes are here, but when you do measurement, if your probes are slightly forward or backward, then you have more errors. Second type of calibration is TRL through reflect line. Uh, uh, and the reflect can be either short or open, doesn't make much difference. And the reference plane is here at the cent uh, center of the through standard. Uh, the reflect standard can be either short or open, as long as they are identical to both of the poles. They don't need, uh, they doesn't need to be a, a perfect, I mean, perfect reflect. I mean, the, their reflection, uh, I mean, they don't need to be a perfect re reflect, give you a 100% reflection, that's not necessary as long as they are the same, identical to the two poles, it, the, the algorithm will work. And the line standard uh, provide an electrical length uh, of between 20 degree to 160 degree, as long as it's uh, facing this region, the calibration technique works very well. And the, uh, the algorithm will uh, rely, uh, relies on line standard to work out the characteristic impedance of your transmission line. So it's a very important uh, standard. TRL requires a minimal knowledge of electric behavioral standards because you don't need to load the electric uh, the, uh, uh, per se, uh, inductance of the reflex standards. But sometimes you need multiple lines to cover the broadband measurements because, the, for example, for this line, maybe the works at particular frequency. I mean, the electrical lens is in this region, but uh, for a different frequency, uh, its electrical lens may be uh, 15 degree, so it will not work. You need a large, a large line to do that. And the second popular calibration technique is LRM, line reflect mesh. It's actually very similar to TRL. You can just think the mesh is, you can think it as a uh, equivalent to an infinitely long low space line. So it's steward line. So it's steward line reflect line. So it's TRL. So it's just a different type of TRL calibration technique. And the reference plane, again, is at the middle of line, uh, line standard. And the reflex standard can be either open or short. And as long as they are equal, uh, it doesn't matter. So they don't need to be perfect. So LRM doesn't need the knowledge of parasitic capacitance open and short. So it's very good. But the behavior match needs to be fully understood. <coughs> LRM is very suitable for the fixed probe spacing. Because for the TRL, for example, for the through, your spacing between two probes is less. But for line, the spacing uh, increased. So, but for this LRM technique, all these standards, their, their spacing between two probes are fixed. So it's an ideal technique, you know, can be used with probe cars, you know, which you have fixed probe to probe spacings. And there's another calibration technique called LRM. Uh, it's uh, very similar to L, uh, LRM. The difference is that you, you will need to match two reflex standards, one is short and one is open. 
for this one, the difference between LRM and LRM is that uh, the match inductors are calculated for using open. So you don't need to know, uh, you don't need to full, uh, know the match standards fully, you know. As long as you know it's the real part. The imaginary part you can calculate from the open standard. So that's an advantage compared with LRM technique. Uh, maybe you have noticed LRM technique uh, requires the same set of standards as SOLT. Because SOLT also have these four set of standards. However, LRM requires less information about standards and give better results than SOLT. And it's uh, less sensitive to probe placement errors too. So it's a very high performance calibration technique which is suitable for fixed group separations. So ideally, for, uh, if you want to automate your calibration and or measurements. <coughs> the last one, uh, as, as, big, uh, as previous week as mentioned, is a multi-line TRL. Uh, it's developed by the US, a National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we, we also think this is the best calibration technique. It uh, involves multiple lines you know, used for all frequencies. The varying weighting uh, solves the problem of band breaks of commercial TRL. Mm, it allows very high performance calibration using on wafer standards and has been established as a reference calibration technique to metrology to like NPL. However, the downside is uh, it, it consumes, uh, it needs a large space, you know, and sometimes space are very expensive. So uh, this table will just summarize these uh, calibration techniques very briefly. Uh, to us, uh, the multi-line TRL provides highest frequency and the most critical standard is online. The TRL gives a uh, reasonably accurate uh, calibration, and uh, again, the most critical standard is line. Uh, for LRM, LRM, you need a line. Uh, you need to know line and match standard very well. For SOLT, you need to know all these standards very well. Uh, there also exist other calibration tactics, like SOLR. So this haven't been covered here, but uh, maybe it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good you are aware of this. Uh, next, I want to talk about some recent research activities and take an NPL and Futronic. And before that, I want to show you our measurement capability at NPL for S parameters. So, I mean, we have very good uh, capability below 50 gigahertz. In this table, I'm only showing you our measurement capability at the millimeter frequency above 50 gigahertz. We have a uh, coverage for waveguide bands 50 to 75 gigahertz, 75 to 110, 140 to 120, 500 to 750 gigahertz. We have uh, our wafers, uh, at probes, you know, uh, purchased and then maintained for all these four wave band bands. Uh, so by the end of this year, we are also going to repair our, our pair of uh, E-band extender heads. So uh, we are going to have a uh, capability, a manual capability for E-band as well. And we are going to pr purchase probes for this band as well. And for the D-band, we expect by the end of last year, we are going to have a manual capability, you know, cover this wave band band. And uh, actually, we already purchased probes for this band. So now we are just waiting for the extender head. Uh, for probe station, for our measurement in the probe station, we have uh, two sets of probe stations. One is the in house, uh, in house manual probe station made by NPL in our workshop. It's on the left hand side, actually, on the left hand side. On the right hand side is the commercial manual probe station, uh, which can works at mean wave and terrace frequencies. Uh, this probe station has thermal, uh, thermal chuck included for probing temperature range from 25 to 150 uh, degrees. And it also includes two ceramic chucks. So if you are uh, interested in testing with different boundary conditions, because sometimes people want to test their device, uh, they, they don't want to test them uh, with the metal shock engines. They want to test uh, to see where the performance change if you put uh, ceramic you know, chucks under this. So it also includes two ceramic chucks. Uh, this production just got installed last month at NPL, so uh, it's in, in operations now. Uh, next, I want to uh, list uh, some factors affecting military of planar, uh, planar measurement. Because when the frequency is rising, the measurement, plan wave measurement becomes more and more difficult. Because there are so many factors, and they affect the precision of your calibration and measurement. Uh, to give you an example, uh, you know, this is the illustration of CPW dimension uh, structures because CPW uh, structures are most common calibration standards. You know, you, you are going to say, uh, and uh, when the frequency rising, you need to consider uh, all these four rules. For example, first the W and S 
needs to be adjusted to achieve the desired characteristic impedance, I mean 50 ohm. And secondly, uh, your state adapter ground width, ground width should be at least two times your, <coughs> this is called uh, ground, ground spacing, two times D. And uh, your total state adapter width should be smaller than the, uh, the value given here. And the, this frequency is the maximum frequency uh, you, you want uh, your calibration to operate. And, uh, and lastly, don't forget that there is a substrate mode, and it has a cutoff frequency. And this, uh, this cut frequency is uh, a function of your substrate height. So uh, when the frequency is very low, uh, you still need to consider these four rules. But uh, it, for example, you don't need to care about this too much, because the frequency is very low, so, and this one is huge. But when the frequency goes up, moves up to meter frequency, or even to terahertz, you'll find sometimes you don't have much room you know, when you choose the dimension of the CPWs. So that's just give an example, you know. So it's, things become one more difficult, you know. And one more thing you need to consider when you uh, design habitation standards or when you design your circuits. On this slide, I have listed uh, some factors. Uh, design of habitation standards, impact uh, from labor structures, cross-talk effects, and unwanted modes, propagation unwanted modes. Uh, there are also other factors. Uh, like uh, testing boundary conditions. Uh, the previous speaker has published a very good paper on this. So uh, you can have a read, uh, get a hold of that paper and have a read. And also probe with different pitch size. Because your CPW structure can uh, accommodate uh, probes with different pitch size. However, <laughs> you'll find the results from the probes with different pitch size at same frequency range are different. So at a meter of frequency. So this is some, something also need to be considered now. And also contact repeatability and the definition of reference plane and more and more. <laughs> so because of time limitation, I'm, go, I'm only, only going to uh, show you some uh, the impact of from these four factors. The first example is the TRL calibration using different reflex standards. This work was done uh, in collaboration with Phil Uh The previous speaker already mentioned, you know, TRL is a very good technique for team embedding, you know. If you want, uh, if you want, don't want to do probe tip calibrations, uh, uh, on wafer calibration, TRL is a very ideal uh, calibration technique because you can set the reference plane. The desired reference plane can be the same as the device under test, so it's a very good one. And you can include the calibration standards on the same wafer as your device under test, and they don't, you don't need large space, you know, for this standard, so it's a very good one. <coughs> so that's why. I've we have uh, include uh, some key band uh, calibration standards, uh, TRL calibration standards, on a 50 microsig uh, diamond asteroid substrate. Uh, uh, for, for the reflex standard, we have include both open and short. Uh, at this frequency, now uh, neither of this is ideal. But as I mentioned earlier, for TRL technique to work, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be uh, perfect enough. But we still want to try to see where where this uh, where this different uh, reflex standard contributes any difference in your results, and the last thing I want to mention that is a uh, uh, we call this launch because the structure your CPW probe you have CPW structure, but in reality our device is max strip, so we have this launch. It's a very simple CPW to max strip transition, and the the L here we call uh, launch lens. In this uh, work, we have included the calibration standard for different two different lengths. One is 100 micron, and one is 300 micron. One will work, 100 micron one will work. Why? Because, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, for example, for this one, for line, uh, you're, uh, you will have a quarter wavelength line here. So if your launch is uh, greater than uh, one eighth wavelength, so if you add all this together, then it's become half wavelength. <coughs> it, it become a resonator. It, the reason, uh, if, you, if your structure is all CPW, it doesn't matter because you don't have any discontinuity. But because you have this kind of discontinuity here, so then you have kind of some res you have kind of some resonator because you kind of reduce the copy, weak copy here and here, so you have a resonance in your results. And you don't want that. So, so it's recommended that this launch distance should be smaller than one eighth wavelength. On the other hand, uh, you also want this uh, launch lens to be as long as possible because you want, here is CPW mode and here is max strip mode. 
you, you know, it takes some lens for the mode to fully, max rate mode to fully established. So there's a trade-off here. So we suggest you to uh, make this uh, one inch wavelength. So the 100 micron one notch uh, fulfill this requirement, but the 300 micron one doesn't fulfill. So then here I show the results. <laughs> here this is measured, uh, this is after calibration, and uh, this is the measured results over line. This S11, S21, S12, and S22. As you can see, uh, firstly, uh, the, for example, 100 micro launch, 100 micro launch, you see their response, uh, different reflex standards, open and short, their uh, response are identical. That means the reflex standard doesn't make much difference. So no, no matter whether it's open or short, doesn't make much difference. However, the, the results from the different launch, uh, there are much diff huge difference. This is the uh, result of the 300 micro launch. You say it at 175 years, the S21 goes to around zero dB. It's not physical. The reason for that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because you have resonance, because it's too long. So this kind of resonance, you know, and the calibration can't get rid of resonance. So that's why even after calibration, you are still seeing resonance behavior at higher frequency, and uh, you don't want that. So that's something you, some rule you should be bear in mind when you design similar structures. Yeah, and for this work, we have uh, caught, uh, we have captured our raw measurement data and the process in using different calibration. So uh, that means we don't need, we, we have rule out impact from contact repeatability. And the second uh, example is the impact from the neighbor structures. You know, uh, during a wafer probing, uh, the probe shadow region should be kept free of uh, structures to avoid coupling between probes and the nearby structures. Uh, surrounding the device under test or calibration standards. Otherwise, there will be noticeable dips or resonance in your measured transmission res uh, response, regardless of what calibration technique you employed. And you, have, you will have more dips. You will have more dips you, if your transmission res uh, response, you have, you, if you have more than one labor structure. Here, choose one example. Uh, I, I reproduced it from a paper uh, published by a German colleague. Uh, you know. so, he, he simulated the, uh, the results of this uh, line, and he altered during simulation, he altered the length of this surrounding structure, this line. And as you can see, when the line is increased, the resonance uh, moves you know, to lower frequency. So it's, there is a direct relationship between the length of this labor structure in your uh, transmission results of the, of the device that you are really care about. So you need to bear in mind, if you want to do a wafer calibrations, and you have a lot of uh, nearby uh, surrounding structures. Uh, for example, uh, this is an example produced, uh, provided by colleagues from Fieldtronic. Uh, they have uh, included some KRL calibration standards uh, in their uh, E-band uh, wafer. These are device and these are calibration standards. Uh, I guess they want to just the same cost, so they, these standards are placed very close to each other. So these uh, standards are very close to each other. So during pre uh, probing or calibration, you will have this coupling between probe to the nearby structure. So the impact is that, so after calibration, the, the red line is uh, using the original standard. You will see resonance in your S1. This is the measurement result of the line. I mean, after calibration, you will see resonance here. And this is the measurement result of the open standard. You can see you, your Smith chart is now smooth. You have this kind of resonance on the open, uh, on, uh, on the, for the device of the open as well. So that's the reason for that is uh, this coupling. So they are very clever. <laughs> so their process engineering is very good. So they manage to remove the matte coating of some labor structure. For example, this, this, is a, this are through standard and this is open standard. They want to, they use these two in the calibration, but uh, because they want to get rid of the impact from this line standard, so they just remove this matte coating of the line standard. And uh, similarly, for this line standard, they have removed the coating you know, of the uh, through standard and open standard. So basically, their impact on the result can be uh, animated. And it's true, you know. So they have done a redo the calibration using this modified standard. And then you see the blue line is the results. You can see the resonance is gone. So that means that proves uh, the, the, the point I, just, I, I want to make earlier. So this probe, this copy, you know, from between the probe 
and the nearby structures uh, surrounding your device and <coughs> should be taken into should be considered when you design design this uh, device and calibration elements. So the final example is the comparison of S parameter from we've got and we've got an a wafer. Uh, our, uh, our objective was that, as you know, at very high frequency, I mean, for example, about 100 years, on wafer measurement, there are so many factors affecting your results. So what's your target, uh, what's your desired uh, results? We don't know, uh, we, we don't trust calibration, and we don't trust measurement, so what's our uh, objective we should work towards? So then uh, we have a work with colleagues at uh, PDB in Germany and Fr Fraunhofer in Germany, we, we thought about, we can mount the planar structures. We just add two probes and mount it into a waveguide and then do a waveguide measurement. That could serve, serve as a reference to us for our waveguide measurement, as long as we can be embedding you know, to here. So this is, a, this is a planar devices we have done. And here is the, uh, with two uh, with passion antennas. And we just mounted this. And we have measured many of these different devices. There are uh, 20 dB attenuator, 30 ohm, nine short open node, not node, and nine different things, you know. Uh, and we have done a uh, wrong, uh, wrong table, a uh, wrong robin comparison. So basically, Fraunhofer have fabricated this and mocked, uh, have assembled this, and then uh, Fraunhofer sends the device, we've got device, to PDB for measurement, then sent to us for measurement, and we have, here is a measurement result from three different organizations. This is we've got measurement results. As you can see, there's very, very good agreement between three organizations. So that means, at very, at mean very frequency, only a wave guide measurement are still quite reliable. Uh, because we are using different frequency extender heads, different VNA, doesn't matter. It will still give you very similar results. Then, uh, similarly, because we want to do a comparison between wave guide and on wafer, so Fraunhofer has fabricated this on wafer structure as well, and uh, so this is a, a device we have measured nine, uh, uh, nine and mismatch short attenuations. Uh, I want to point out that Fraunhofer has fabricated, uh, this is a device we have measured. They have produced three sets of devices. One is using a, a probe to pad design like this. They call it a shielded probe, a probe design. And the other one is a commercial one, and this one is an open one. So, so basically, we have three sets of devices. Uh, for our information, we have measured three sets of devices. The devices are the same, but the difference is just this probe to pad design is different. And, the, and we found uh, this one is uh, give you the best results. This is actually shielded design. These are wire holes. So it's actually just like a fence, you know. We shield the impact from the nearby structures. Because these devices are placed actually very close to each other, but it doesn't matter as long as you have this Closed probe to pad design, it can uh, reduce the impact due to cross talk, pair out mode, and the neighboring structure. And uh, we have done our wafer measurements, and then we compare this with the waveguide measurement. Uh, as you can see, for our wafer measurement, the, the, the results from the three different organizations have a uh, noticeable difference because, as I mentioned earlier, our wafer measurements are more complex and more difficult to manage at these very high frequencies. But uh, we have very, uh, relatively good agreement between these uh, three organizations. And we have relatively a good agreement between the unwaver results and the waveguide results. So that makes us uh, feel more confident about our unwaver management technique. Means uh, our uh, results are kind of re uh, reliable during, uh, from the exercise uh, we, we, we did together. So, uh, here is a conclusion. Uh, I have briefly uh, described uh, conventional calibration techniques for on wafer measurements, and I also uh, have talked uh, through very quickly some recent activities undertaken at NPL and Fieldtronic in military on wafer measurements. And uh, I have uh, listed a few factors affecting the performance of your calibration and the measurement at these very high frequencies. Uh, much of this work was undertaken in collaboration with UK industry. So if you have any management challenges for, uh, for our wafer management, uh, please think of us. You know. We might be able to help you. Uh, we are a government-owned lab, so sometimes there are some scheme you know, which can cover our time and cost. You know. So we can do, basically do the work free of charge for you. Uh, lastly, I want to acknowledge uh, the support of, from uh, University of the UK. The project is a joint project between Fieldtronic and NPL. 
uh, the label project is ultra high frequency intercompatible compound semiconductors, and also the support from European Metrology Program projects, uh, Planar and the Tent. Uh, they are Europe, uh, they are the funding is provided by European Union and the Empire Pacific United States. Thank you very much.